the book as it is now was not what I began to write and it isn't what I set out to do. Um, it was about the removal initially of Boris Johnson and, and the reason why I decided to write the book was because so many people, A, asked me to and um, felt that it was enough that Boris Johnson's removal after five prime ministers and party leaders being publicly ousted or abruptly being removed, leaving, mm. um, was, was a, a step too far. And it wasn't until I started writing the book and listening to people and going back to speaking to some people going back 30 years in the party that I realised that there was something really unpleasant and quite dark that's been happening at the heart of the Conservative Party for quite a long time. And it was really interesting because it was like, you know, a jigsaw puzzle that had been tipped upside down on the table. And I didn't know what that jigsaw puzzle, what the picture was going to be when it was all put together. And everybody I spoke to just put another piece in. And as I went through both the research for the book and talking to people, this, this picture became really clear. And I was utterly shocked completely shocked at what I was learning. So you're saying there's a, a kind of under, a malaise that underpins the Conservative Party? It's not a malaise. This is a group of people. Not always been, the same people? The same people, a group of people, there's about 12 of them in total, who have since um, the late 90s, I mean, some of these people go back with their involvement to the mid 80s. Some of them Norman Tebbit thought he'd got rid of. What they learned from their kind of like public ousting by Norman Tebbit was to go under the radar and do everything far more covertly. And that's what they've been doing since then. It's become very clear, having read parts of it, that this is goes far beyond Boris. It starts, as you say, decades before. Yeah. What does it start with? So it starts really with the removal of Ian Duncan Smith, what that was about, why was Michael Howard imposed, what was that about? And then it was about David Cameron and George Osborne. And people who think David Cameron, um, his leaving and his resignation wasn't engineered. What I discovered was that by the actions of individuals, David Cameron really was, was pushed into that position of being not being able to do anything else other than resign. Michael Gove, as everybody I spoke to attested, was never a Brexiteer. And then suddenly, when David Cameron demoted him from the cabinet to his cabinet position as education secretary to chief whip, there is, there are, I mean, this is well attested in many newspaper reports and, and accounts that people have. Michael Gove was absolutely destroyed by that, literally destroyed. A, because he couldn't keep Dominic Cummings at his side any longer, because there wasn't a role. Cummings was his aide, of course. Yeah, before. but been his long been his aide. I mean, Michael Gove is Dominic Cummings. Dominic Cummings is Michael Gove. They are like that and have been like that for well over 20 and still years. Are. And still are. Well over 20 years. So after David Cameron demoted Michael Gove, that was it. It was over for David Cameron. So they... they they went onto the Brexit, Michael Gove went to the Brexit side. Now you might say Brexit won, what if they hadn't won? Well, what that stopped David Cameron from doing was being able to have cabinet collective responsibility yeah. in order to have the government mach machine fire into the Remain campaign. And of course, you know, Brexit did win and that was never going to result in anything other than David Cameron having to resign. Yeah. So via, via some very clever means, David Cameron ended up resigning, and we've lost so many. It is extraordinary that the party of power and government is so undemocratic that these people are put in place and removed by no one who has a vote. People know who I'm talking about, and I don't think it's going to be too long before somebody may decide that they're going to do the outing for me. I can't do it, and I can't possibly say who some of these people are, but I think it's only going to be a matter of time. Yeah. But what is their game? We know there's a line in the book. I spoke to a very senior um, individual, again, who I can't name, and, and I recounted what a cabinet minister had said to me. And a cabinet minister had said to me, you know, the thing about Michael Gove is you've just got to try and work out what the end game is. And I recounted those words to one of the sources and he said to me, no, 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 what you have to understand is it is just a game, no end game. 
it is just a game. Now, I don't know what, what it is. The one perplexing comment so many people made to me was, including Ian Duncan Smith, including, you know, everybody who was very principled, Ian Duncan Smith does not tell lies. And the, the one thing I think I, I realised by talking to many of these people and to Ian was that, and Ian said it so many times and so did others, and so did Boris. Boris says it to me numerous times in the book. What is their agenda? Like, are they putting forward a, a new radical programme for government? Are they putting forward the, the basis of a new manifesto for an election? Are they wanting to turn the Conservative Party in a different direction? And of course, the answer to all of that is no. And Ian said, you know, they would never articulate to him what it was they wanted. He knew the minute they were going to destroy him. We knew the minute they were going to destroy Boris. These people have been controlling the party and driving government. For what? And that remains the big question. For what? Why do they do this? What is the, the evidence that this is, or what, from what you've seen, the interviews that you've conducted, there's evidence really on every page in the book because everything that people said, we had to we had to get multiple sources. I was even asked to get some people to swear affidavits. We had to get multiple sources, and then I had to find out how much that information had already been tested and published. And it was remarkable over the years what people were telling me. Ninety percent of it has been published and written about already mm. at the time, you know, it was... And you've put it together. I just put, so over 20 years, I pulled all of this together into one book. So it's not conspiracy, it's not, it's all already written, written by, mm. about by journalists in newspapers over the years or in books. You know, one piece of information I was given was about how Michael Gove begged David Cameron to um, keep Dominic Cummings at his side when he was made Education Secretary. And I, my publisher said, mm. so the person who told me the story, who worked in number 10, told me Michael Gove was white and shaking when he came out of the meeting with David Cameron. And my publisher said to me, no, we can't put that in the book. You have to go and find somebody else who'll say this. So I went and found somebody else who said it. And they said, no, two people are not enough for this. You need to find more information. So I thought the only person I'm gonna be able to go to is David Cameron. And David Cameron did confirm this. In his, in his own memoirs. Mm -hmm. Michael in Gove his, said you're a very good fiction author. Yeah, well, that's, that's the attack. Been his and, to you this. know, I was told weeks ago by a very kind person, a source fairly close to what's happening in number 10, weeks ago he told me that the attack lines against you are going to be um, with kindness that you're a best selling fiction author, with menace that it's a conspiracy theory mm -hmm. and with hatred that you're mad. So that, that, that's the route of attack they're going to go down. And absolutely. And when he told me that, I thought, oh, we'll see, we'll see. Absolutely bang on the button. Are they still there? That's the point. Yeah. Are they still well, in number 10? Are these people lurking around Rishi Sunak? So the thing? very worst individual, the most, you know, the one I've written about in the book who's, um, you know, Dougie Smith is um, he's the guy who used to run the fever sex parties. He's at Rishi's right-hand side. He's already also grooming the person to take over from Rishi Sunak. And anybody who thinks Which that... Which is who? At Kemi Badenoch. OK. So, yeah, very close friends, you know, many, many... And it's so fascinating because since, you know, I finished the book before it went off to the printers and stuff is coming at me that, you know, I'd be able to write another book with. So is Rishi in danger, is, I suppose, the ultimate? Oh, question. Rishi doesn't realise he's been totally played and totally used. And, but he's you know, a bright man, Nadine. Would, would he not is he? know that? He must know some of the stuff I am sure you're talking about. He knows am, who Cummings is, for goodness sake. Yeah, I'm sure Rishi is a very good and honourable person, but he was very politically naive. And I think what they saw was kind of like, you know, the thing about Rishi is he's like, you know, he's like a boy band member on autotune, isn't he? He's like, he's got the looks, he's got the suit, he's got the background, he's got the money. He's, you know, he fits all the demographic, but he was very politically naive. And these people, I think they just, they've seized him they've, and they've, they've captured him. You know, when that stuff came out about his wife's non-dom status, you know, well, my theory is that when Rishi Star was rising, what they don't like is somebody's star rising too high. Really interesting that all that stuff hit the news because they do like to go for the wife. We saw it with I Boris was Johnson. Say, you, you mentioned in the book, you, from Ian Duncan Smith to Carrie Johnson. Carrie, but interestingly, not 
Samantha well, no, Cameron. Because Cameron very much was the project, and they did they've done it with Akshata. And I don't think Rishi realises it. it was probably just to deflate his tyres slightly to make sure that he still needed these people. Dominic Cummings, Michael Gove, Dougie Smith and the others that well, I Well, this is House of Cards stuff. It's actually, you know what, it's... So isn't it weird because the House of Cards is fiction. What I discovered when I was writing this book is that actually fact really is far stranger than fiction. You speak in the book about briefings happening against... Tory, well, Tory on Tory briefings, but you also talk about Keir Starmer and Labour mm -hmm. being briefed against what was going on within the Tory party. Is that something that's still happening to this day? So there was somebody in number 10 who over a, I think it's around 10 years, um, has been nicknamed Red Throat. And journalists even nicknamed this person Red Throat. They, nobody knew who it was. It was a civil servant who was leaking to somebody called Paul Overton who is like the dark arts guy in Labour, who's literally at Keir's right-hand side. So, and they've never known who it was, but this person's been leaking into the top of Labour for a long time. And it wasn't just that. You can tell us, I hope, about um, an incident with the Red Box, whereby notes that were supposed to be passed on to Boris Johnson from yourself had actually yeah. been changed by the time you received them. Yeah, tampered with overnight. But, you know, it's quite a chilling phone call for me to receive very early in the morning to say to me, you need to know that yeah. the advice note that you put in the Prime Minister's red box overnight to be signed off has been changed. Okay. Did it feel strange sitting in those cabinet meetings? Did you sense that there were, you know, eyes looking out of paintings, metaphorically speaking? Well, we always knew. Michael Gove took notes at every meeting and um, a cabinet meeting. It's kind of against protocol. You don't take notes at, you know, cabinet meetings. He had two notebooks that he used to write in. And one cabinet minister saw me looking at him once. He looked at me and winked. And he came up to me afterwards and he says, he's writing it all down in shorthand and it will be in a newspaper before our cars have even got back to the departments. And sure enough, it was. How do you think he's going to respond to the book? I've heard from in number 10 that uh, there's a bit of a meltdown going on over it. These are people who've managed to stay right under the radar for all of this time. They will not like being out at all. Well, Nadine, thank you so much for talking to us about the book. It's obviously available uh, today. The plot, the political assassination of Boris Johnson, I think it's fair to say, and other stories. I was going to say, I need to say, and everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Nadine. You're welcome. <laughs>